Thank you, Simon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This is the first time I've been in the library since I spoke here to the Society in December 2019. It's nice to be back, and it's even better to see so many familiar, I was going to say friendly faces, but let's see how the talk goes before we decide on that. Um, shortly after Christmas, it struck me that I might need to put this talk together pretty quickly. And when I looked at my files on the computer, I found that I, under the heading Scarborough Police, I've got over 5,000 documents. I just want to reassure you that I'm not going to be uh, quoting from all of them this evening. But I have put quite a few words in the presentation um, that you'll see on screen. Partly because it is being recorded and you can watch the recording, stop the show and actually see the words in full. I shall just be drawing your attention to some. There aren't a lot of images. There are some that I've credited on screen. There are some from newspapers, and there are some excellent ones, including the ones from which I took the pictures of Patterson that you can see on the screen, to which I was provided with by Les Shannon. So thank you, Les, who always does a great job in helping me. I also want to thank Caroline, who, as usual, has kept me supplied with coffee, etc., while I've been putting this all together. So, Superintendent Patterson and the Scarborough Police, 1865 to 1898. Until Les gave me the pictures electronically, I had never seen an image of Patterson, even though I'd read many thousands of words about him and his work. But I've taken these two See if I can bear with me. I'm not used to. I've taken these two images, which you can see um, on the screen. Um, there he is on the left, supposedly in his early days in Scarborough. And there he is on the right, with less of a moustache, um, within a year or so of his resignation in 1898. Now I say I have some doubts that this really is so early because there are far more policemen in this picture than there were in Scarborough when he started here in 1865. So it may be slightly later, but there he is sitting there. And here he is sitting again in 1896 to 97 this is up on the South Cliff at the residence of the mayor for that year, Marillier. And this is the corporation, the mayor, the corporation, and some of the leading officials. And there he is, um, I can't work that side, um, to, the, to the right. I want to put this quotation in your minds. Historians, often inclined to deal mainly with the powerful, should also listen out for the voices of humanity at large. Those are the words of the great James Hunter, Emeritus Professor of History at the University of the Highlands and Islands. And they come from his book, published a few years ago, Set Adrift Upon the World, the Sutherland Clearances. Hunter has written a great many fascinating books about Scottish history, particularly about the Highlands. But I like these words because he's put down there something I believe in. Now, I have spoken to the society in the past about important individuals, obviously Harry W. Smith, more recently, the eccentric Tudor James. Tonight, about William Patterson. 
But when I speak about those people, I'm also trying to draw attention to the work that they did on behalf of others. Smith, of course, creating attractions for Scarborough that provided employment during their creation and when they were up and running, and who also was responsible for a major slum clearance programme in Scarborough in the 1920s. Tudor James, would-be friend of fishermen, rejected by local fishermen, but his services, what he had to offer, greatly appreciated by visitors to the port, particularly fishermen from Scarborough. And Pattison, who, who did a lot of good for a lot of people in Scarborough. This is an amazing picture. It's a funeral cortege in Elder Street in June 1898. And it shows a funeral cortege of Mrs. Brooks and her six children on Saturday the 11th of June uh, 1898. Five coffins. Two contained the bodies of the four youngest children and then there were one each for the two elder daughters and Mrs. Brooks. They had died in a house fire at 48 Queen Street in the early hours of Wednesday the 8th of June. The father was the only person to escape from the building. Ironic, because he probably caused the fire. He went home after drinking and left the cigar unextinguished on a surface. But he got out of a window. The rest of his family were not so fortunate. And the fire has, was described as one of the most terrible fires which has occurred in the provinces for many years. And it was the occasion, as we'll see at the end of the talk, if not the entire cause, of Pattison's downfall. That's the house in Queen Street. Images like this appeared in a number of newspapers because this fire and the inquest that followed and the popular hostility to Mr. Brooks featured in newspapers throughout the country. Mrs. Brooks and the father. Pattison's background Born in 1833 in Embleton, Northumberland. Joined the police in Newcastle. Transferred to Shields. Rising to the rank of inspector. Then he moved to Beverley, where he was superintendent of police. Meaning he was in charge of the local force. And highly regarded, as these words show. In Scarborough, he replaced Superintendent Roberts at a time when it was felt the local force needed a great deal of improvement. And this report from the Watch Committee draws attention to that. Determination on the part of the council to reorganise and improve the police. Patterson was appointed to do that. Just one or two details of his family. His wife was Anne or Annie. There's not much information about her in the newspapers, but we do know that she was involved in charitable work. And it certainly, um, this is recorded a number of times in the uh, 1890s. Two daughters, Margaret and Emily. I've not found anything out about Margaret at all, but Emily was prominent in local Scarborough music circles. And this is just one of the reports of a concert that she was involved in in 1892. She had a very fine voice, apparently, as well as a desire to perform and to raise money for charity. But we don't hear much of her after June 1896, when she married and moved away from Scarborough. 
Patterson was not just the chief officer of the local police force, he was also the inspector of nuisances, but also accumulated other positions. And in 1875, when it was proposed to increase his salary, uh, Councillor Yeoman opposed it and said that Patterson was already very well re rewarded and went into detail. His salary was £170 a year. He got money as the Inspector of Common Lodging Houses and as Superintendent of the Fire Brigade. Then he was given a residence and ver there are various other benefits. If you do look back at the slides later, this is a particularly interesting one. And then it you know, um, the speaker referred to the perks of Patterson's job, including that he used men from the police force to work the field, his field. I've not found out anything more about that. It has to be said that in spite of these criticisms, at that stage, most of the councillors um, entirely supported Patterson because of the good work he'd already done. He wasn't, and this will become clear as I go through this talk, he wasn't someone to sit at a desk. He was a very active officer, which could be dangerous. It was reported, for example, in January 1885, that he'd met an accident at a recent fire at the Grand Hotel. He'd sprained his leg and was confined to his house, um, being treated by one of the doctors, Taylor, who were the police doctors in Scarborough. He did continue to live in the town after his resignation. And in, eight, in 1901, of course, by then he'd had to move out of the police accommodation, he was living at Mount Pleasant, Queen Street, according to uh, a newspaper, uh, sorry, the census. And he died here in 1906, aged 72. So his fall in 1898 didn't give him any desire to leave the town. As I've said, he was responsible for the local fire brigade and was very active in that. Um, a fire discovered at a house, or at a, a joiner's shop in Cambridge Street, and Patterson and others put it out. And if you look at the last sentence, it was only by extraordinary exertions on the part of the superintendent that the fire was at length got under. This, of course, is where the police station was and the fire brigade base. On where St Thomas Street joins Castle Road. And although... Um, it was inadequate. It did survive as a building until 1971, apparently. And that's the site, that famous car park at the end of St. Thomas Street. I got this from the internet. It's by you know, a man called John S. Uh, Turner. This fire in March 1878, I'm just going to give you one or two examples. A man effected an entrance by, oh, sorry, it says by one of the widows. It should, of course, be windows. <laughs> I wish I'd spotted that one. <laughs> Sometimes I put jokes in deliberately, but it, that, that's not the case. And was followed by the chief constable with an axe. So he went into burning buildings. This one's also from the internet and originated with a certain Christopher Hall. Uh, under the same common license. And it's that far end of um, the, the area where it, uh, it joins um, uh, St Thomas Street. That's where that fire took place. 
I thought this one was appropriate, a dangerous Christmas tree. December 1890 started a fire in Cross Street, but soon put out. But the falling of a Christmas tree into the fire is what caused the building to catch light. A fire at Wood End. I thought I'd mention Wood End since it's got connections with Scarborough's uh, history. Uh, Police officers arrived but weren't needed. This one is particularly interesting um, because the chief constable was telephoned for, they had that by 1893, and and climbed with Sergeant Anderson onto the roof to play onto the fire. So, very active. By 1893, he'd be 60. I wouldn't have liked, when I was 60, to have been climbing onto a roof with a hose. But, of course, the most famous fire, apart, well, alongside the one in Brook Street, was the one that was um, immortalised by Atkins and Grimshaw in this famous painting, um, Sick Transit Gloria Mundi, which is in Scarborough Art Gallery and comes courtesy of the museums and and galleries as they're now known. This was the fire that destroyed Paxton's version of the spa in September 1876 and Patterson and his men were there to fight that fire but um, so too were uh, people from the South Cliff. Patterson and his men at one end of the building, these locals and, I think, um, spa employees at the other, but the building couldn't be saved. And the replacement took a long time and was very expensive. I did think there was a certain irony about this, though. January 1893... For three, Patterson was fined in the magistrate's court for allowing the chimney of the police station to take fire. So he wasn't safe from prosecution. What about the size and composition of the force? I'm going to deal with one or two aspects of this before I move on to um, consider um, the variety of work that was done. Well, you'll see that at the beginning of the period, it was felt that the police force was far too small, particularly given the number of visitors to Scarborough in the summer months. When Patterson left office, the police force was more than twice as large as when he'd taken over, and probably could have done with being larger still. The Watch Committee in 1865, at the time that uh, Patterson was appointed, thought the present number of the police to be utterly uh, inadequate. And the discipline to be far too lax. Charges of an immoral and disgusting nature were about to be made against one of the officers. Now, I bet that's got you intrigued. It got me intrigued. I've I've never found out any (laughs) more about it, unfortunately. I have searched high and low, but I've not found anything more about that. Soon, Patterson was putting uh, notices in the newspapers about the sort of men that were wanted for this augmented force. Intelligent young men, active, 20 to 30 years of age, 5 foot 10, able to read and write, and be of irreproachable character. 
when they did join the police, they were encouraged to maintain their irreproachable characters. And um, fairly soon, they began annual tea meetings. Notice, tea meetings, no alcohol. Organised by a local missionary. We have them here in 1868, and again in January 1870. And some at least were won over. One of the members of the force said if it were not for the drink, there would be very little for policemen to do. Uh, he didn't mean in terms of they couldn't find anything to do but drink, but drink was at the heart of crime is what he was getting at. The police force, the members often wanted to press for pay rises. And here you get some idea um, of, of the sort of pay that they got. And the fact that there were different classes of constables. You rose even within the rank of constable or at least you hope to. And the salaries were soon raised. The inspector went up from 30 shillings to 32 a week. I won't read them all out, but you'll see they're all getting similar increases. The, the town did recognise the importance of maintaining the force that Patterson was making so effective. It was, of course, also inspected centrally by a government inspector. And they were, the men were got together, inspected, and then the books, the offices, the cells were also inspected. And the reports are invariably very positive though occasionally there are suggestions for new things that might also be done as we'll see um, there's a more detailed version the, the offices and cells found to be faultlessly clean the inspection and minute examination of the books concluded the inspection Here's one where there's a recommendation. In 1893, the inspector, Sir Herbert D. Croft, recommended that more men in the force should join the St. John's Ambulance so that they could uh, help injured, wounded people. And we find next year that many of the men have taken examinations in first aid and one of the people who helped was was given their presentation and then again in 1896 if you just look at the bottom um, bit the mayor presented the certificates gained by the men in their recent examination in the principles of first aid as taught by the st john ambulance association so what the inspector had recommended did come about. Not that at all was happened. One of the problems that the police had was to do with the running of the local court. Most cases were heard in the borough magistrates court. The magistrates being drawn from the most prominent men in the town, often councillors. But quite often the police would be in court with people against whom they wished to press charges and no magistrate would turn up and it would have to be sent for. So that was one inefficiency. The answer, of course, would have been to appoint a stipendiary magistrate, a paid professional. And it was suggested a number of times, but it was never done ostensibly on grounds of cost. 
In reality, the cynical amongst us may think, because it would have led to these other magistrates losing at least part of their power. It wasn't all work for the police. There was a police cricket team. Tended to get beaten by the York police cricket team. But there you are. There were excursions. And this um, extract reveals the existence in 1893 of a police boating club, which went on an excursion. The mayor, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Stebble, had introduced a more general excursion for the police to Haven Wyke by rail. A variety of activities followed by tea at the Haven Wyke Hotel. Some of the force one day, leaving others on duty, the rest the next day. And Patterson hoped that this would become an annual event. I'm not sure it did. To find out about the police, the watch committee reports are very, very useful. Here's one example. The town council meeting, the watch committee reported a number of things about the local force. The employment of a detective and 52 extra constables from York and Hull. This sort of thing happened when there was a big event on in town. They had to bring in extra police, often for Scarborough races. And notice the, the last sentence, the committee reported they had dis dismissed Police Constable Mansfield for misconduct. Another report, again showing the variety of things that the Watch Committee reported on. An increase in salary for the police surgeons, a meeting calling for the police to deal with furious riding on the sands, something which I've mentioned in previous talks and we'll be coming back to later, um, and then various other things. So it's a whole variety of information. Also useful are Patterson's annual reports. He had to present an annual report to the Watch Committee and via them to the rest of the council on the force and its work. Very useful. For example, in December 1875, the police establishment was 28. A head constable, one inspector, three sergeants, etc. To a population of 24,000. Still felt to be small. Late 1880s, he goes into the numbers of people that had been summoned, apprehended, and otherwise brought before the magistrates, showing that the vast majority were male. And then it goes into different types of offences and uh, some of the sentences. And then it goes into those who were dealt with simply by the local magistrates. Police force of 38. This is an interesting one. The police discovering um, doors open and it says insecured. We would say unsecured. That's what one of the things the police looked for at night when they were on their beats to see if premises were in danger of being broken into. And you get some idea of the cost. And something I'll be coming back to later, prisoners apprehended in the borough and handed over to other forces for offences committed elsewhere. Very much, this is his last annual report, 878 
people had been proceeded against. 160 convictions for drunkenness. I ought to mention at this point um, that some of us at least are going to adjourn to the Lord Rosebury after this meeting, um, but no drunkenness is anticipated. You do find some policemen misbehaving. The worst example is when a police constable brutally assaulted uh, a police sergeant who'd found him intoxicated on his beat. Notice the date, November 1865. It's within a couple of months of Patterson taking over. The policeman hit his sergeant a stunning blow to the side of the head with his staff. Resulted, resulting in Johnson being off work for some time. And eventually the uh, police constable was put on trial at the county assizes, the quarter sessions um, for the county as it were, um, and sentenced to 12 months with hard labour. Uh, you do later get irregularities and these, are, these particular examples are again, I think, to do with drink. And the chief constable had entirely by then withdrawn permission for men to have a drink whilst they, during their hours of duty. Didn't stop them all, because 16 years later, PC Philpot was intoxicated on duty and dismissed. And it was Patterson keeping order within his force. He'd reported him. Sometimes police officers were assaulted by others. Sergeant Wake, a policeman attacked and injured. Some others arrived and were very badly hurt. A labourer assaulted a policeman at the race course, often a scene of trouble at the two annual meetings, and a young fisherman summoned a few years later, and it said it wasn't the first time he'd been charged with assaulting the police, so it looks like uh, this was his hobby or whatever. The f oddest thing, one of the oddest things I came across was a serious accident to a policeman on duty in Huntress Row, went to examine some premises. He got over a low wall, but didn't appreciate that there was a 20-foot drop on the other side and landed on his head. So police work could be dangerous even if you weren't being attacked by people. Um, he was discovered by his brother, also a police uh, officer, and discovered to be suffering from concussion. Pretty nasty. The Scarborough police worked with other forces. And I ought at this stage to say, when we're talking about Scarborough police, we're talking about the old borough. Foldsgrave, for example, wasn't within its jurisdiction. Foldsgrave, like um, villages, Caton, Seymour, Burniston, Cloughton, were served by the North Riding Police Force. But inevitably, the two had to cooperate a lot. But I'm thinking here of Patterson being invited to visit Gloucester and going down to Gloucester and Stroud um, in connection with a man who'd committed crime in Scarborough. going to Leeds in connection with a housebreaking in Scarborough and the other way round and all these are from 1860, late 1865 a, a Liverpool police officer coming through to take to Liverpool to put on trial a Scarborough cab driver this one is fascinating. Um, a man had disappeared from Burslem, 
having, it was alleged, embezzled somebody. The police couldn't find him. He then, and this is a year and a half later, settled in Scarborough. And a local police officer arrested him, recognised him from the information from Burslem and arrested him. And a Burslem officer came to Scarborough, identified him and took him back. In, Le in 1885, the Leicester force paid a, a visit to Scarborough um, a holiday occasion, but also some liaison between the forces. I put the heading use of technology. Um, you may not think this is all technology, but I couldn't think of a better word. Use of the telegraph and photograph to help track somebody down. And again, photographs taken and sent to other forces. So these are people who were wanted for crimes in Scarborough, had left the town, and help was wanted to bring them back. And uh, just sending descriptions by letter. Or advertising in the Police Gazette, Head Constable Patterson, Chief Constable Patterson, placed an advert for a travelling bicycle thief. Oh, it seems to me bicycle thieves will tend to travel, but there you are. A big theme in the town, and this come, brings me back in part to that quotation from James Hunter, was a desire that the police and the population should work together. In 1878, Patterson complained to the magistrates that a lot of shop owners, shopkeepers, were not putting their shutters up at night, so making it easier for people to break in. And even reporting that uh, sometimes they were left without the shutters all Sunday. And so Patterson appealed to the public to cooperate. So cooperation is wanted. And it comes along. In 1879, a bathing machine proprietor wanted further police supervision over the bathing grounds in North Bay and the matter was referred to Patterson. The Pier and Harbour Commissioners wanted cooperation in enforcing a Fisheries Act, etc. So, with a force of that size, cooperation between the force and the general public was highly desirable. The scale of crime this may come as a bit of a shock. I'm just going to reproduce some figures that appeared in the Illustrated Police News under the heading Criminal Classes at Large, the latest figures from the Home Office. In London, there was one person of known bad character to every 222 inhabitants. In Towns of the small and mixed textile manufacture, one in 154. Commercial ports, one in 110. Woolen and worsted manufacturing towns like Leeds, etc., one in 118. Seats of hardware manufacture, one in 109. Towns dependent upon agricultural districts, one in 90. And pleasure towns, including Scarborough, one in 79. 
So a higher proportion of bad characters in Scarborough than in London. Fascinating figures. The variety of crime you might think you could get from the quarter sessions records, but they're not very good at revealing this because not many cases went forward to quarter sessions. So in 1865, you've got attempted pocket picking and theft. 1871, again, only five prisoners for trial and two of them uh, were not proceeded against. What you need to do is look at the variety of work and see how it all fits. One unpleasant thing the police had to do was deal with bodies. Here, the dead body of a female child, it means a baby, um, found um, in a well in the, the park garden. The park keeper found it, a policeman actually had to go and recover it. A fatal street accident in 1892, a girl knocked over by a cab. Patterson himself was nearby and ran over and picked her up and had her taken to her home, where sadly she died shortly afterwards. So that's one type of work. Another type were to do with Brewster sessions, the annual sessions to do with the licensing of pubs. And there was a lot of work in connection with these, and I'll just give you the one example. 1871, August, Patterson reported on the number of people keeping licensed premises and the number that had been summoned before the magistrates for um, offences against their licences. I won't say any more about that, but Brewster Sessions uh, are fascinating. Keeping watch. For some weeks past, there have been frequent petty robberies and the police have been watching out, though they've been baffled. Dealing with poor behaviour. Three lads aged about 14 attempting to set fire to a letterbox in North Marine Road, a pillar box. Something that Patterson did feel strongly about, young people misbehaving on Sunday nights. Could be discarded the news now, couldn't it? Snowballing when people were heading to church. And some, people, some young people aged 15 to 20 put before the magistrates for that. But Patterson, it was said in May 1888, was good at trying to control poor behaviour in the town. Disorderly youths at the railway station. But it wasn't just youths. Youths usually means young men. Here is a young lady accused of behaving in a riotous manner in the park on Sunday night. The park, of course, being the one in the valley. It was the only one in, in Tuscarva at that time. Um, and using the most disgusting language to young men. And she was locked up. And in fact, it was at this very sort of time that local clergy and others ran a campaign to clean up the park. But they didn't mean removing weeds. They meant basically removing amorous couples. Um, a street nuisance. Too many people, either in bath chairs, in other words, elderly people, or pushing trams were blocking the highways, or the pavements, rather. And again, 
behaviour had to improve. He, Patterson would direct attention to this matter. A music nuisance. A man who ran a waxworks um, in Nubra played music inside, which could be heard outside, and that led to complaints. There was a whole spell of matters relating to the Salvation Army. I've not fully got to the bottom of this, but uh, as committee members know, the Salvation Army has a particular relevance to us at the moment. A petition was pre presented from inhabitants in the neighbourhood of the Salvation Army barracks relative to the nuisance caused by the noisy and disorderly meetings of the Salvation Army. But others were charged with disturbing the Salvation Army. All these events happen at this time in the early 1880s. And uh, the proceedings of the Salvation Army in Huntress Row were complained about by a local surgeon. I, I intend to investigate all this further and see if I can come up with what's really going on. Militiamen featured often in the courts. Scarborough was a place where militiamen, in other words, volunteers, reservists for the army, came to do training and practice at the castle and later at the racecourse. The landlord of the Black Horse pub in East Sandgate was dragged out of his pub and assaulted by a party of militiamen. Three and a tinner charged with being drunk and fighting and assaulting the police. Funnily enough, on a race night. Militiamen again accused of being drunk and assaulting PCs. Um, a major fight in North Marine Road um, on sa a Saturday night. Saturday nights, as Elton John sang, were all right for fighting. And in fact, they were commonly uh, fighting. Um, and this became a major confrontation. Um, the police had to set, get reinforcements to deal with these militiamen. Again, if you look at the slides afterwards, well worth reading. A number again charged with assaulting the police. I've put a few examples of this in just to show that it's not a one-off thing. This is for Mark and the Maritime Heritage. And so on. Fishermen in trouble. Four-hole fishermen charged with breaking into a fishing smack in the harbour and stealing from it. But also fishwomen fighting. Um, this one's interesting because it, in the fifth line it says, a disagreement arose between the pair and they went at it with their tongues like fishwife. Well, they would, wouldn't they? But then it became physical, and when they appeared in court, their faces were, were damaged. As they left court, having been fined, they looked unutterable things at the witness. I think we've all seen that in uh, television programmes and so on. Furious driving of fish carts. And Patterson said special instructions had been given to the police constables to stamp out this sort of behaviour. Fish carts were often in the news um, in a holiday resort because of the bringing of laden fish carts from the harbour up the main streets of the town to the railway station. 
and spillages from said carts. In fact, one of the times it was proposed to, before the marine drive was built, to put a tunnel through the castle headland from the north, uh, South Bay to the north, it was then proposed to run a railway from the harbour along that through Pease Home to connect with the main railway station to stop this fish cart nuisance of things um, spilling onto the streets and smelling badly just where the holiday makers were heading for the beach. In late August and early September 1896, and again, I think. And Mark, you'll find this particularly interesting. Me there were major disturbances as a result of disputes between South and East Coast fishermen. Nothing to do with the Scarborough fishermen. These were Cornish and essentially Lowestoft fishermen who had become engaged in a dispute in Cornwall earlier in the year because the Lowestoft men went out fishing on the Sabbath and the Cornishmen didn't. And there'd been major trouble there. So later in the year when they're in Scarborough, trouble's anticipated. Ugly threats are heard on every side. It was stated a Lowestoft boat purposely collided with a Penzance boat in the harbour. There were also reports of fishermen hurling herring at each other. Seems a bit silly to be going out with all the dangers of fishing and then actually ending up throwing the fish at each other. But again, Saturday night was the problem night. Because it was traditional for the fishermen on a Saturday night to go out drinking. The Cornishmen stayed on their boats on this occasion, being greatly outnumbered. The Lowestoft men went out, and when the pubs closed, there was a riot. A great deal of violence, provoked by one Lowestoft man, aged only 20, who had been in hospital for months earlier in the year after being injured in the troubles in Cornwall. The police had a job containing this. And who was at the forefront? Patterson himself. This, this is, these um, fishing troubles are reported widely in the press. And Patterson is said to have broken at least one staff over the rioters. Some reports suggest more than one. He always had a staff with him. And to try and keep control, they were actually physically attacking the, the rioters. There was some smuggling. I've only came, come across one brief example to quote a French skipper. Well, it would be, wouldn't it? It couldn't be a local. There were dangerous drivers even then. Angelo Sigsworth summoned for furiously driving a Lando on the Esplanade, a horse and car, or carriage. A postillion summoned for driving on the wrong side of the road, on Foreshore Road. So dangerous drivers are not new. Resisting the police, a married woman was charged with being disorderly, not drunk, just disorderly, and with resisting a policeman. But the chief constable knew nothing against her, believed her to be a very respectable woman, and so her penalty was light. And this again is Patterson's influence. He would often be asked, do you know anything about these people? He and his force, of course, kept records, and if they didn't know anything, they would say. Or if they knew positive things about people. Drunk and disorderly. A labourer charged with being drunk and disorderly at the police station. A youth 
about 14 or 15, charged with being drunk and disorderly, challenging men to fight. A prostitute, drunk and disorderly. Patterson, I was going to say had a thing about prostitutes, but that might sound wrong. Um, he, he, he was very concerned about prostitution in the town, as we'll see. A racing man, charged with being drunk and disorderly in Nubra, it's race time again, annoying foot passengers, in other words pedestrians, by throwing fish about. A married woman, drunk and disorderly, resisting the police. Drinking and driving. Drunk in charge of a horse and cart at Sema. Always knew Sema was a dangerous place to visit. Refusing to leave licensed premises. Interestingly, this particular one is described as a Negro labourer living in William Street. He wouldn't leave the licensed premises when asked to do so and was fined. And then, of course, you've got the crimes of violence. Uh, Dutch fishermen apprehended on charge of, a charge of murdering a woman with whom he lodged. Couldn't find anything more about that one. Stabbing. Striking someone on the head with a hatchet. Highway robbery. Now that, of course, conjures up images of men on horseback and guns and so on. It isn't. Two, a married couple attacked and stole from um, a man um, who was uh, coming away from the stables in Falconer's Road. Falconer Road in this account. Highway, yes, it's a road, but it's, it's not what the, the headline suggests. There was a garrote robbery. And here, the Illustrated Police News, one of its Scarborough illustrations, three men attacked and stole from someone on the foreshore road. Foreshore road could be a very dangerous place. Thefts often by assistants, people stealing from their employers, including, in this case, from the famous Cerrone photographic artist, stealing animals. 19 ducks from a stable on North Marine Road. Quite often from hotels, the Bull Hotel, the Grand Hotel, and the Grand Hotel again. Theft from the railway company or railway station. Most of these offences were pretty serious. This one less so, but sad. A box, a charity box, they, they did exist back then, stolen from a wall at the station. Thefts of flowers and garden plants. This one's interesting because this particular individual was accused of stealing from public gardens, the spa grounds it means, but also from private ones. As I say, I'm trying to show the variety of crime. Visitors being targeted, a visitor who took money out for, from a bank and fell into bad company. And when he got to his hotel, he had no money left. A gentleman at the Cambridge Hotel had his dog stolen. A female visitor left two gold rings in a bathing machine, and when she went back, they'd been stolen. And in fact, it was one of the 
assistance to the bathing company that was charged. Housebreaking doesn't tend to come up a lot. Maybe they didn't think this was interesting to report. But there's one example. A man and a woman entered and ransacked a property in Ray Lane. Pocket picking. Three people charged with frequenting the town for supposed unlawful purpose. Patterson would not leave, would not press any charge if they promised to leave the town at once. Patterson undertook to see them out of town. There's quite a few things like that. People against whom proceedings were started but not carried at, fully out as long as they left town. This is the late 19th century and it reminds me of nothing else than the Tudor Poor Law. You know, you don't pay relief in a parish to somebody if they're not from that parish. You move them on and they go to parish, some of them after parish, after parish, trying to get back home. And it's this, let them go and cause trouble elsewhere, I think. Poaching, quite a few poaching um, incidents, especially on the local estates of Lord Lonsborough. This one was serious because the head keeper was injured during it. Various complaints to do with betting, Ille betting generally was illegal and here was a house uh, sorry uh, the fleece in the landlord was allowing betting but if you read anything about pub history in this period that's a complete no-no raid on an alleged betting house a man who was using his house to allow people to bet. Again, it's August, it's the time of the races. Card sharpers, th this one is brilliant. Um, people are going to the race course at the top of Racecourse Road on Seaman Erton Moor, would arrive in Scarb at the railway station and walk up there. And the quickest way was to walk up to Sandy Bed and then go up Jacob's Mount, Jacob's Ladder and up. And so card sharpers set up gambling schools on that footpath to trap people going to and from the races and to encourage them to bet. Um, again, seen off by train at night. So the races are a, a source of criminal statistics and the hiring of extra staff by the police. And of course, the race meetings stopped in the 1890s because of popular local opposition to the sort of activities that were associated with them. Indecent assault comes up, an old man accused of um, indecently assaulting a young girl, sent for trial. Prostitution comes up a lot. Um, Patterson was obsessed, I think, in 1871 with prostitutes working, well, frequenting the Royal Hotel and had the manager charged but the case was dismissed this one June 1872 a, um, a, a prostitute and her client engaging well, in indecent conduct this is before Peace Home Park but it's in the Peace Home area and then of course those who kept it kept brothels, Patterson was determined to put them down. One, man, one young man claimed he'd been robbed at a brothel. Uh, 
And then Annie Hall, someone for keeping a disorderly house by allowing prostitution. A disorderly house was how they're often described. And I've put these various examples up to show that they were in different parts of town. John Rushton claimed he knew of many brothels in 19th century Scarborough, but never came up with the details. When I was teaching a general studies local history course at the Sixth Form College, I did mention 19th century brothels in Scarborough, and one lad stayed behind and said, did you mention X Street off Victoria Road? And I did. He said, I live there. My mother is convinced our house was a brothel in the 19th century. And I said, what on earth gave her that idea? And he said, our front doorstep's much more worn down than any, <laughs> any other one in the street. <laughs> he, they had no documentary evidence, but he thought that might be a good indication. Oh, and this one is... Um, again from the Illustrated Police News. Um, a father burst in upon his daughter and her paramour um, at a fashionable boarding house. And the paramour could only escape by climbing out of a window. The Illustrated Police News loves things like this, where you can have a nice pitch, you know, that galop robbery and then this. Using sheets or a sheet to get out of the bedroom window vagrancy this one may be of interest to you chris because um you've been researching brickyards haven't you and brick manufacturing they were often places where vagrants slept overnight yes but 19 individuals brought up on this particular occasion charged with um, sleeping in the brickyard, one brickyard on Filey Road and the other on Seema Lane. It seemed to be very popular for that. Undesirable visitors. Begging. People who were simply suspected to be of, up to no good. Men seen lurking about in Newborough and Eastborough in the evening and they couldn't give an account of themselves. They had come into town for the races and had not yet gone away. And it's another case where they promised to leave town so they were discharged. Again, card sharping on the road to the races. This one's a great one. Sentenced to a month's imprisonment, the prisoner, can't you find me and I'll leave the town at once? But the bench wouldn't agree and he went, was taken into custody. Very interesting because what it suggests is he's almost expecting a fine as a sort of fee for what he's done and then he'll be allowed off. Not on this occasion. Bad money circulated. And remember, £12 in 1866 was a lot of money. And again, during the race meetings. Embezzlement from employers. Simply fighting. Again, in the park in Valley Road. Two, two young men are arranged to meet there to fight, they did. One died as a result. So the other was accused of manslaughter, though later found not guilty. Feminine amusement, two women charged with fighting. And of course, concealment of birth. Mary Ann Thompson, charged with this offence, she dropped the body of her, her baby into the sea. In 1867, in October, 
it was reported that nine cases of concealment of birth had already been known. These would be generally single women, often young, gave birth often prematurely to babies that wouldn't have lived and uh, concealed the bodies. Cruelty to horses, furious riding, which I referred to earlier. A young man comes to town on a trip, hires a horse, doesn't really know how to ride it properly, runs into two children on the beach, one of whom breaks an arm and has other injuries. The exposing of bad meat or fish for sale occupied the police force's time. Patterson played an important part in this sort of thing. So, one case here, meat, the other uh, shrimps. Touting at the railway station. I am getting towards the end, ladies and gentlemen. People going and stopping people to the railway station, stopping people who've arrived in town to either offer to carry their luggage for a fee or to recommend a particular place to stay. But it wasn't just at the railway station. Touting and obstructing the footpath in Westborough. Two other women find for causing an obstruction by selling crabs on the footpath. Three women stopped by a plainclothes policeman. He had to be in plain clothes because they, they were very vigilant in looking out for uniformed officers arriving. And Patterson said that the practice of touting for lodges had increased greatly in recent years. An obstructive preacher. He comes up a few times, Abraham Chambers, charged with causing obstruction by preaching on Fortral Road. Loitering with carriages. Again, blocking the area of the sands. There are some sad cases of persistent offenders. Bridget Rowley appeared many times um, I don't know if she's related to anybody. I hope it doesn't cause offence by mentioning it. Appeared at least 110 times before Scarborough magistrates. Many of the charged occasions were drunkenness. But there were male equivalents, notably Robert Hunter, who lived in the old town, but was better known as Daddy for Craycaton. Daddy from Creighton. And charged with being drunk and disorderly at the police office on Saturday night. Um, he's fascinating because quite often he'd have too much to drink, realise it, and then go to the police station. So they'd lock him up for the night, he'd have somewhere to sleep. In 1916, it was reported that he'd made his 132nd appearance in court went back to the 1870s. Criticisms of Patterson, they do happen early on. Here's what an example from 1873. But they're rare. But they mount later. In 1889, um, Thomas Whitaker, JP, was very unhappy with Patterson. Mind you, if I had to choose between Patterson and Whitaker, I'd go for Patterson any time. But that's another story. 1897, he's criticised for not keeping good discipline. 1897, again, criticised for the way in which he conducted the betting raid. A betting raid. But the criticisms came to a head after that Queen Street fire that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. The watch committee summoned him back because he had left the town on holiday a few hours after the fire and they didn't think that was appropriate. And they, he was invited to resign. 
He said he'd had to go away because it had been arranged for ages. His wife, who was ill, was in Birmingham. The brother coroner knew and he was planning to be back for the main parts of the inquest. But this didn't save him. And on the 16th of June, 1898, he's, as requested, he sent in his resignation, which was to take effect early in September. He would retire on a pension of £215 a year, which was a lot of money. He also got a presentation from the members of the force and the corporation officials because he'd served the town for 33 years. And generally, and I'll come, I haven't put any conclusions um, on the PowerPoint, but generally I think he did a very good job. He was hardworking, brave, intelligent, articulate, very, very active. He may have become increasingly overbearing as the years went by. I get the impression that he rubbed up the wrong, rubbed up the wrong way. Um, more counsellors as time went by. And I think there was some looking to get rid of him by 1898. When he would have been 65. Um, and this was an opportunity to do so. But he's clearly an important figure in Scarborough's history and he, his police force did a lot of good work. Thank you very much ladies and gentlemen.